Good evening and welcome to the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandungwa Kumalo. This is episode 17 of the Private Property Podcast. And of course, on day 40 of the national lockdown, we're on level four. So at least we've got a little bit of room around what we can or cannot do. But I hope that you are staying at home and you are staying safe during this period. As promised, today we'll be looking at five secrets your estate agent wants you to know. This is a conversation that specifically for people who are looking to buy. So if you ever had any questions on what estate agents want you to know, this is the conversation for you. Oftentimes, some people are a bit skeptical around estate agents or they don't know what they should or shouldn't be asking. So if you had any of those reservations or question marks, this is certainly something that you don't want to miss. And joining us to understand what estate agents uh, want us to know, uh, want us to know rather, I'm joined by Annette Evans, who is the general manager of the Institute of Estate Agents in South Africa. Uh, good evening, Annette, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you inviting me and uh, it's wonderful to be able to still broadcast from um, home, I must say. I know, right? So I think this is probably one of those things where they, where we are grateful that there certainly are certain things that we're able to do. I mean, a lot of us are now using, whether it's Zoom or meetings or whatever other platform uh, that we're, we're using. And in, in some ways, it's slightly overwhelming because we're not used to it. But in others, it's quite helpful that you know people can be watching us from the comfort of their homes and that we're able to do it also from the comfort of our respective homes. But I mean, you know, let's get into it. I mean, I think there are so many people who shown an interest in property. So many people who want to be buying, they're going on to www.privateproperty.co.za and viewing different properties, uh, even on the social media platforms that we are posting on. But of course, as estate agents, there are probably certain things you would want um, buyers to know. Let's go through some of the things that you think we certainly need to know as we navigate our home buying journey. Okay, well, I think that um, really one of the critical things that we needed to discuss is that under lockdown, essentially, the agents are not able to show people properties. But I think that gives everybody a brilliant time to actually get prepared. And that's what I really, really think we could focus on. And my biggest consideration for, for people who are looking to buy, let's say we're focusing on the people who are buying at the moment, is that they should use an estate agent who is registered with the estate agency of Facebook. And we all know that being you know, a licensed property practitioner means that they are regulated by an organization such as the estate agency of Facebook and usually belong to an organization like ourselves, the Institute of Estate Agents, to keep their skills and remain professional on that aspect. And Annette, how would people know if somebody is registered or not? Because I think we're already seeing so many different people um, starting their own, I'll say, smaller practices, um, opening their own businesses, saying they're selling a property. I mean, I could potentially even start Zamandunga Kumalo properties and then start selling people or try to get people to give me mandates of their respective homes. How would a buyer actually know that if Zamandunga start, decides that she's going to you know, start selling houses, that I am in fact registered? So there, there are a couple of ways. The first way is to obviously ask them to see the Fidelity Fund Certificate because that is what they pay towards and it protects the public towards that fund. And then the other way is to phone the estate agency of Facebook, check that that estate agent, you know, where they're at. And the other way is to actually search the estate agency of Facebook, which is essentially www.eaab.org.za. And all estate agents have to be registered and licensed with the estate agency of Facebook. It's not, um, it's not um, optional. It's an obligatory thing that they have to, be, have to do. Okay, so now we've got, um, you know, you, you've, you've, you were able to, you able to establish that the estate agent that you're dealing with is in fact um, registered. What would be the second thing that you would want us to know? The, the most important thing, I think, for somebody to sit down and discuss with their family, their, depending obviously who they're planning to buy the property with or who it's for, you know, all those circumstances, and actually analyze and, and sit and think carefully, what are your needs? What are your wants? What are your requirements? Um, we all know that um, I have a saying, sometimes you can't even afford what you don't like. So you have to know what can you afford? What, what are your, firstly, 
just um, to go back to the basics and say, right, where do we need to be? What is our schooling requirement? What are our transport options? Um, where can we find value to, you know, value for our money? And then to sort of work backwards and say, right, we need so many bedrooms and we need so many bathrooms. And then that's when you connect with, with an estate agent or you connect your search and you say, right, let's start looking at what we what we actually matches to our requirements. I think that's that's really important. And, and be able to sit to be able sorry, just to be able to sit and actually have that conversation because often people don't agree, but it, it's all about fine-tuning what you need to that search. And, you know, Annette, I can imagine um, how much of a hassle it probably is if, let's say, you're dealing with a couple and they haven't had that conversation, right? And on the one hand, one is saying, no, we'll look at only two bedroom apartments. And another says, no, I only want uh, a simplex and minimum is three bedroom. And so even trying to, um, you know, suggest different, top, uh, different properties that you may have in your books become so difficult because they haven't actually sat down and decided this is round about what we're looking for. So whether it's a two bed, two bath, um, or a three bed, two bath, whatever the you know their respective specs actually are, it does actually probably make the life of the estate agent uh, slightly harder if if somebody hasn't gone through that process. Absolutely, and and I think that like everything, I mean, you you may want something and then realize afterwards that you actually don't need that. You may be able to sort of turn another bedroom into something, or you may be able to convert. There's so many, you know, you leave yourself room for sort of open um, negotiation as well. And you may feel you really, really need three bedrooms, but you may actually discover that you've got a loft and you can convert it. So or you may need a work from home environment, but you can actually do it quietly. You know, like we're all learning now. We all are learning what we need. And I think that it's, as you said, have the conversations and they can be very uncomfortable. But yeah. And you could say, well, we want two or three. We're not sure. You know, so you yeah. can always yeah. have that option. But but look around and see where in your often you cross a railway line, you cross a busy road, you get more for your money, but then you've got you've got to kind of toss up the pros and cons. And then and that's how imagine, you end up making the decision. And I mean, and I can imagine how much of a nightmare it probably is if you're also not clear about what your non-negotiables are. So in the yeah. same breath, in understanding sort of the, the big picture scope of you know two beds or three beds, but also not being clear. Um, what the non-negotiables are could actually be quite a frustrating process for both the agent and also the, the buyer. Absolutely. It's nice to have worked that all out and then say between and either or and then have that quite um, quite strongly kind of worded. And then your, it just makes your search a lot, lot easier. And then you start to see where the value is. And I think that's important because if you're starting at, at looking at such a huge range, you're going to, you actually get overwhelmed. And I think that's the big thing. Um, frustration and overwhelm is what you actually want to avoid and focus on, on you know, getting the value. And I think that is really the ultimate thing that both parties essentially want. I think as an estate agent, you probably want to give the most value to your clients. And as somebody who's buying, you also want to be able to get the best value out of um, you know, the whole process for yourself. If you are joining us uh, right now from home, I'm joined on the line by Annette Evans, who's the general manager of the Institute of Estate Agents of South Africa. And we're talking about the five secrets um, that every estate agent wants you to know. And this conversation is, of course, course aimed at uh, buyers so in the event where you are buying and you're not quite sure what an estate agent would want you to know then this is a conversation for you now and so we've already got the first two the first one being of course user registered or licensed agent the second one is establishing your needs so understanding you know the type of property that you probably want whether you want two bed or three bed you definitely want two bathrooms no matter what happens but just being very clear about your needs um you know whether you want schools around your area or perhaps well, one of your non-negotiables is that you must have at least three different malls that are within close proximity to where you stay. <laughs> Being clear about you know, those kind of boundaries does make the search that much better. What would you say the third thing um, agents would want us to know as we search for our property? Very importantly, it's uh, about costs and affordability. Um, that is that is something that I find I get a lot of calls about from the public and uh, people didn't necessarily understand what they were taking on. And I think it's about being 
very, very aware of what your costs are. So you have, luckily in this country, we have a very defined and clear National Credit Act, which is, which is actually wonderful. But ultimately what people need to understand is what could be those costs that they weren't anticipating. Um, and they, they would be obviously your monthly bond costs. And then also what's very important, I think, is to understand loan to value. Because when you when you take out your, your bond and the higher the amount and percentage and loan to value, all this terminology you're going to learn, but ultimately as the loan to value goes up, um, that means the more you're borrowing, the higher the interest rate is because the banks, they actually um, they penalize you. So the, the, the better you are at saving and preparing, the better your benefit will be. So it's worth knowing about that. And also the fact is that you are going to have to more or less budget for 30% of your gross income. So that could be your monthly repayment. So that's a very um, much of a nutshell. So if somebody was to buy for 500,000, they would essentially have to pay 5,000 rand a month. They would have to earn three times that as a joint monthly income, gross monthly income. And, 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 you know, the, the, and this is something that I've emphasized and other guests have also emphasized in it uh, when it comes to cost and affordability is that, first of all, the, the amount that you might qualify for, and we'll, we'll get to that um, shortly, might not necessarily be the amount that you can actually afford. So, I mean, in theory, if, for example, you qualify for uh, a million rand bond, getting a million rand bond and servicing that million rand bond and the running costs of that particular uh, property, you might find actually become substantially higher than what you initially thought it might be. So sometimes um, understanding that you might qualify for a, a certain amount, but when you run your numbers, you also have to be quite honest in terms of the state of your finances, uh, factoring in other costs of that property. For example, um, perhaps water and electricity is, is substantially higher because it's a bigger house. Um, perhaps rates in that area are higher than where you're staying. Um, or if you've never bought, then you're not paying rates. You're probably um, just paying your rental. So levies might also be significantly higher um, or higher than what you initially thought. So we certainly certainly have um, you know emphasized the importance of understanding the different running costs of owning a property um, and ensuring that you also just factor that in on your home buying journey. So not just only looking at the monthly bond installment, because the reality is that's not the only cost factor to, to consider when you're looking at a home. So you don't want to find yourself buying the home that you qualify for, and of course being granted that bond, but then ultimately not actually being able to keep up financially once you move in and you essentially carry on. That's so true. And I, I think that is one of my um, highlights to people is you've got to think, you know, job stability, your age, because you may, when you're younger, you may be able to sacrifice more, earn, work harder. But as you get older, you may have different priorities and your debt, obviously, because that, that's, that's the point that you mentioned is that your gross income doesn't determine your debt. So you've got to look at what you're repaying every month and how much you actually can then top up. Um, or how much you can reduce in order to pay that bond. And I must say that the, the biggest benefit of owning a property is that as your interest rate, as your bond payments um, go down, your rent would have gone up. But you're quite correct. The cost to consider are your rates and your levies and electricity and internet and things that you may never have paid before because it's always been an inclusive rental. So I think people can be a bit stunned by that. And also knowing what it's actually going to cost to purchase the property because you've got, you know, the bond costs and things like that. And that's my next point, really. So about the actual costs that you have to pay. And to, before we to get uh, to that, Anish, we're going to take a quick break. Um, if you're watching us at home, you know, you can get you a cup of coffee uh, quickly or even invite more people to join in on this live. I am, of course, joined by Annette Evans, who's the general manager uh, at the Institute of Estate Agents of South Africa. And we're talking about the five secrets that every estate agent wants you to know on your home buying journey. We'll be back shortly just after this. Well, 
Welcome back to the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantunga Kumala. This evening, we're talking about the five secrets your state agent wants you to know on your home buying journey. I'm joined by Annette Evans, who's the general manager at the Institute of Estate Agents of South Africa. And of course, some of the issues that we've already touched on are some of the things that the agent uh, definitely wants you to know. The first one is to use a registered and licensed estate agent. Um, That's very important. uh, So you don't want to be working with somebody who's not um, you know, licensed or registered. The second one is to establish what your needs are. Are you looking for a place that's close to certain schools? Are you looking for a place that's closer to home? So you sort of, you know, break down the geographical location of where you want to live. Are you looking for a three bed, a two, a two bed or three bathroom, whatever the issue is, what are the type of properties that you're looking to? So establishing what your needs are is actually quite important. And with that goes, what your non-negotiables are. Because I think sometimes you might want a three bed, two bath, but maybe your non-negotiable is you know, something out there that you also need a garden. Uh, and not every unit that's like that has a garden. So understanding what your non-negotiables are is also quite important. The third one and it suggested was the cost and the affordability. Understanding what costs are associated um, you know, on your home ownership journey, but more often, than, but more than anything, understanding what your affordability is. And of course, with affordability, it, is, it isn't just about what you qualify for. There are other factors as well. So being able to understand what the loan to value of your, you know, um, particular bond that you're going to be getting is, is also so important. So Annette, let's maybe then look at that fourth um, thing that you think that as buyers, we definitely need to know from an estate agent's perspective. I think um, the top one of the top points would be actual understanding your credit um, history. A lot of people don't know much about credit history; they don't understand. And one of the one of the points I've got in highlight in bold that I always mention to people is don't make too many inquiries on your credit history. Obviously, if, if you've never heard about your credit history, you won't even know what I'm talking about. But every time you make an inquiry, it kind of goes down a notch so it's it's a it's a snakes and ladders approach because ultimately you want a good strong solid credit history that means you pay everything on time you you're always open to discussion with your with your creditors if you if you have any agreements or arrangements to make and also that if you get one free credit search essentially per year and there are 13 credit bureaus in this country but you know, different different organisations subscribe to them. But usually, the, your history is is quite um, available, and then you have to um, monitor it and maintain it very carefully. So what that means, in essence, is you if you kind of went on holiday in March and you forgot to pay something, then it's going to show that in March you didn't pay something. They're not going to understand that you, it was an oversight. They're going to see it as a possible a potential that you have an issue with paying your bills. And when you apply for a mortgage, um, that is a mortgage bond that can be uh, negatively affect you. And, and you know, I, I, I'm actually so glad that you brought this up. Surprisingly, I, 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 I mean, you're, you're mentioning that you get that one free um, report per, per annum. I got my one free report, um, I think, yesterday or two days ago. Uh, I got the report. No, today's Tuesday, so it would have been yesterday. You see, this lockdown actually makes you forget <laughs> how days work. <laughs> so I got mine yesterday, and it was the first time I I went to the credit bureau to actually access it. I mean, in previous instances, when I would work with a bond originator, it would sort of come up, um, and then I would see, oh, this is what my my profile or report looks like. But I had never proactively sourced it and then go through it to understand, okay, what's actually happening here? What are creditors seeing when they actually look at um, my profile? Are there any issues that are there that I think aren't supposed to be there? Luckily, they weren't. So even understanding how to read that, and I think that's probably a, a show on itself, just unpacking the yes. credit report and the credit score. What happened? if you've got a low credit um, score because I know that oftentimes when that score is low it does pose a particular challenge in the home buying journey so definitely we'll be covering that because it's such an important one and I think oftentimes we don't think about it especially I mean I if if I look at maybe a lot of us millennials you're in your 20s maybe even your 30s you're not sitting thinking, oh, I wonder what my credit score is. <laughs> it's low. How can I get it? You know, how can I get it up? If anything, it's one of those things that 
you only start thinking about when it affects what you're trying to do. So in the event we're trying to buy a home and the reason why you can't access that bond or uh, the bank is normally going to extend, let's say 70% or 80% and the reason they cite is you know, a bad credit history or a bad credit score, only then are you, you know, aware that, oh, so this is actually a thing. And by then oftentimes, it might be a bit too late for that property to try and salvage the issue. So knowing early becomes such an important um, thing. So thank you for that, Annette. I think it's definitely something I think viewers would find quite valuable for us to be able to have the conversation and unpack how we can go about dealing with our credit score and, and getting them to the right place so that we can make sure that we're able to buy uh, properties. Yes, absolutely. It's, it is a critical thing. And then, of course, and what would be the fifth thing? I think before we get to some of the questions and comments from our viewers at home, of course, if you do have any questions or comments that you'd like to ask Annette, do send them through and we'll deal with them shortly. Uh, the fifth thing, Annette, that you would like us to know uh, from an agent's perspective when it comes to our home buying journey. Something very interesting is that um, you have as an owner, so once, you, once you're now the owner, and that's your aim, obviously, it's to actually prepare for your rights and responsibilities um, because you are now the, you are your own landlord. <laughs> There's nobody else to turn to. So you have to remember the gutters, the geezers, you know, whatever needs to be done, um, whatever maintenance, um, whatever, um, maintain the condition because let's say, for example, I mean, it happens where you, you buy a property and then you say, right, I'm going to do something different. Let's say I'm going to relocate. Now you want to put the property back on the market and you haven't actually maintained it. So, you know, that's a, it's a big, big thing. And that's, that should be part of your dream, but it, it's, it's, it's an obvious one, but I think that, that that's part of your, that's part of your plan. You want something that you can maintain that will, that fits in with your lifestyle. If you're not a person that spends a lot of time at home and you're not sure how you're going to maintain it, make that plan because you need to retain the value that is you it, it's your biggest asset it's the most of money you're probably going to spend um for, for at least probably a decade for most people and you need to you need to know your ownership and your rights a lot of banks do programs for helping people and sort of i wanted to touch on the fliss but i'll bring that in if you if you kind of wanted to know anything else but yeah it's very very important that once you own the property um, you may not own the title deed because the bank has has land on that, but ultimately it's your property, and you are gonna, you are the one who's going to benefit by the value going up, and you're going to lose out by the value going down. And and I think you know you mentioned first it's definitely going to be um, a topic for another day because we could spend quite a lot of time just unpacking yes. that. That's of course the government subsidy um, that helps you when you're buying your first home if you earn within uh, a certain amount. So it's you know often targeted at slightly lower LSM. So essentially the government gives you a grant to be able to help you in your home buying journey. That is certainly an episode that we're going to be having in the coming weeks. It's such an important one that so many people typically don't know about and can be so useful um, the process uh, as much as maybe it might be admin intensive for others once you get through it you're going to get the grant you'll be able to buy um, your property or certainly will help you in buying your property and yet I'd like us to deal with some of the questions and comments from our viewers as uh, from our viewers at home and of course you can keep sending uh, more questions and comments um, when you're watching us at home and the first one comes from Pakiso Totezi who asks what steps should I take if I want to purchase a property cash as a first home buyer? Okay well that's a very uh, it's a fantastic position to be in. I, I know. Think. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's um, what do they say? Um, location, location, location. So have a look at, you know, don't rush anything because yeah. now you're going to, you, you have, you know, you have to be able to afford the bond cost, the transfer costs, um, bearing in mind, okay, you're not going to have a bond cost, but let's say you wanted a small bond. There are considerations to having, there are benefits to having a bond mm -hmm. um, because you're keeping your cash perhaps available at some stage and it, it helps you to climb the property ladder as well, you know, um, and then secondly, I think the really important thing is to know that you're getting that value out of your property, that, you know, in the property that you buy, in the area that you want to buy. So I think be patient. Don't rush into something. 
Um, and I'm, I'm a spreadsheet girl, so I'd be having the spreadsheet out. I'd be saying, okay, I can buy for that, buy for that. And then maybe in four years' time, I'm going to move out, so what would my rent be and, and, and things like that. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, I don't know if that answers her question, but hopefully it, it goes a little bit way to making it clearer. I think probably one of the, the, the things that we'd say is that um, the transferring attorneys be wherever you want to be buying, it will be handled by the seller. Uh, so the money that you'd have would also, you know, go into that particular account. So there's probably a bit of reservation about how that money essentially moves around because typically you wouldn't have the money because the bond, I mean, the the, the bank would have extended um, that bond facility to you. So it's the, the transferring attorneys would be dealing with the bond registration attorneys. The bank would actually be sending the money over as opposed to you, um, you know, wiring the money from your account to the uh, transferring attorney's trust account. So I think perhaps that was also how he may have wanted to just understand the movement of the money itself, because this, in this instance, as the buyer, you physically have the cash. Uh, also, it's in a bank. I, I hope you're not you know, keeping that money at home. <laughs> you'd essentially, you'd have the money and, uh, as opposed to the money, you know, coming from the bank's perspective. Yes, I think that's an a important point is to actually know, who always know who you're dealing with. Um, there are rules in this country where they're going to check who you are. There's FICA, the Financial Intelligence Centers Act. They want to know who you are, where you got the money from. You know, they, they do their checks to make sure that you are, a, a you know, an upright citizen. But I think to check where you're going to be putting the money in, I think I would definitely have... Um, conversations i mean wonderfully now we can pick up zoom and say hi i'm going to zoom people there are you know there's always a risk when you move money that um i would never just trust say an email i would say i need to speak to that person like we're doing now you know i think that's there are an attorney that should be getting the money in then it will it will go to the deeds office and then the property will be registered over to your name and then because you bought say the house cash you should own the title deed you will get it directly yourself which wouldn't happen if you had a bond. But definitely know who you're dealing with. That is a really critical point, I think, that I can't stress enough. Yeah, and it really is important. I mean, if you're going to be, let's say, buying a million rand property, you certainly don't want to be, you know, EFTing a million rand, and next thing you know, it wasn't necessarily uh, to the right people or the person that you, you thought you were sending it to isn't who they say you, they are. So I think just doing your due diligence um, is just that much more important. Um, when you're dealing with your own money, I think that when the bank is doing it, they also do their due diligence on their end. So they're not just sending that money to, you know, to the people that you're buying from. We've got another question here, um, Annette. This one is coming from Komlani Khachai, who asks, how is the property market going to be affected by this lockdown? Is it going to be cheaper to buy a house? And that's a big question. I mean, a lot of people want to know, is, should they rather just hold on a little longer? Maybe even wait a few months post lockdown before they make their offer to purchase or before they sign those OTPs. Uh, we're all trying to speculate about where the property market is going to be in the coming months. It's an it's a interesting question and a one, one that I have had that conversation around with quite a few people and there's quite interesting perspectives. And one of them is residential property, funnily enough, they're not saying the demand is going to go up or down because they're saying people are learning to work from home. So it's actually going to make people need to appreciate their homes. Um, so if you think about a lot of us are thinking, why do we get in a car every day and drive somewhere where we can actually just set up a corner, have a room perhaps at home and work from home. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting um, perspective. So we can't say right now. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people honestly want to be working from home. I think maybe many of us would certainly want the option to occasionally be yes. able to do it, but yes. working from home full time is quite anxiety inducing. I think I, <laughs> I have to get in a desk to be able to work because I diligently didn't want home to be a workspace. You know, you want it to be your, your haven and you don't want to be thinking about work emails. So already, if, if you're thinking, creating a little corner that's just for work purposes would be such a traumatic experience. So <laughs> some of us who want our homes to be um, safe havens as much as possible. And yet, before I let you go, there's one last question, um, slightly technical, you know, and, and perhaps we'll also pose it to 
to the banks when we have them in um, in the coming few days. And this one comes from Malema Credit who asks, um, does the bank finance people who are non-citizens of South Africa? And if not, how does how do such people get to buy property or properties in South Africa? So, I mean, as you said, it's a technical question and things change. But essentially, if you're if you are a resident and you're earning and you've got an income and you're a resident, then that is you are counted as a resident. If you are, say, a South African citizen living overseas, then they may only count 50 percent of your income. So they have they have uh, categories. But if you're living earning, working, have a salary, are a resident, then they shouldn't be. You know, they've got they've got. Every bank is slightly different. So as you said, that's a, it's a technical question. And, and, and I mean, I think I, I would definitely uh, say my name like, is to go to the question, to the episode where we had um, a representative from APSA. We had it last week, um, fr the previous Fridays, because last week was a public holiday, um, where we actually had a conversation, um, you know, a Q&A. So the questions that you would like to ask your bank. And one of the questions that did come up was, the financing of um, you know property financing for non-South Africans and it's, there's a really great answer around certainly APSA's perspective and how they finance but as Annette says different banks do apply different matrix to how they go about financing but there certainly is that facility for non-South Africans they just you know work it differently for different financial institutions. Uh, another question and if that's coming in is from uh, Stephanie Whitbow who asks how can someone check the value of a property prior to purchasing and ensuring the price charged by the owner is fair? That's a twofold question because I think the mm -hmm. two aren't necessarily related in some instances because the value, uh, actually, I'm going to let you answer it before before I, I, I give my take on it. So I actually do, um, we have a property sales database, which we actually keep. And so very much what a state agent will do is they are not valuers, but they can offer you a, co a comparative market assessment or analysis. And they should be able to say to you, okay, this went for this price because of this, and this went because of that price. Um, you know, there is what you call market value, which is a willing buyer and a willing seller, but not every con not every sale or purchase is, be is, you know, between a willing buyer and a willing seller. But that's why you do your research and you say, okay, um, you, you have to talk to people in the area and find out also where you see um, the property and trend in that area, because every, every area has a different trend. And as I mentioned just now, you can cross a main road and today that property is not worth a lot. And in two years time, there's a demand. So that's something you have to do your own research as well and ask, ask, ask. I always say you can't ask too many questions. If you have a question, you need to ask that question. And I think it's also just about us getting comfortable with asking those questions, uh, especially to our estate agents and even to ourselves, you know, as we're having these, the, the, the different episodes, we've now become a daily podcast, simply asking these questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to property because we're really all entering it at the level that we all know. And there's always something that we can learn from each other. Sometimes what one you know, property investor or somebody who's bought or sold the property does might help somebody else. So really being able to share some of the tools, tricks and insights that we've all kind of picked up along the way does come in handy. And yet before I let you go, any other tip that you'd like? I mean, we've already covered the five um, and I'll go through them briefly um, before letting you go. But any other tip that you'd like to give um, our, our buyers um, right now? Yes, I think what we didn't cover is um, the actual looking at the physical property, the, the, the sort of the actual, so you've got to go through your house and say, okay, um, you get, when you're a seller, you have what you call a disclosure, and you would need what you call certificates of compliance. But those are those are objective things, but you've also got to be subjective and say, look, um, you know, can I cope with that? Can I live with that? Will I need to pay for something to be done? Because I always say to people, we live in our homes. We're not we're not trying to sell something to somebody that we picked up last week and we're trying to get a good price for it. We actually are quite emotionally attached to our homes. So people are wanting the best um, price for their properties because now they need to go and buy something else. But be realistic when you go and see the property and don't have to view it once. You can view it twice if you, you know, once at night, once in the morning, you know, different times to see what the area is like. And then you actually have to, to, to look at the property, you know, with all its warts and all, as they say. 
Yeah. And I suppose that also just really does go with, you know, what are you willing to compromise on? Um, and when you kind of become slightly clear about what you're willing to compromise on, and suppose you're getting more and more attached to a particular home, like you're saying, going back to view it again, it's, it's, it's not an inconvenience. I mean, this is, you're about to commit to a 20 year long, sometimes maybe even longer relationship. So don't feel as though you're inconveniencing the estate mm -hmm. agent if you want to view it again. I mean, I sometimes say, especially when you start getting very serious about a particular property, not only drive around, you know, during the day, drive around at night, you know, go mm -hmm. drive around on a Friday evening, see how that area is like on a Friday evening. Does it become suddenly rowdy? Um, and even going there, uh, you know, on a, on a Sunday afternoon, are you okay with it on a Sunday afternoon, but really trying to get a sense of an area at different times and whether whatever the atmosphere is like in that moment is something that you're comfortable with, okay with, and so, and, and a place where you see yourself, um, certainly living in the next few years. Annette, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been quite insightful for our viewers at home. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, thank you to everybody for giving up their time to listen. I'm, I hope they, they get some benefit from it at the, at the end. It's no, certainly. I think if anything, it's not even so much about giving up their time. It's about investing in, uh, you know, investing in the knowledge so that we can help each other on our property journey. That is Annette Evans, who's the general manager at the Institute of Estate Agents of South Africa. And we're talking about the five secrets that every agent wants you to know on your home buying journey. And briefly, those five are use a registered agent, establish what your needs are, um, be sure about what your cost and affordability is, understand the credit your credit history so that you're clear um before you get your bond uh, you know what your credit history actually is and that last one is pre prepare for the rights and responsibility of actually owning a property and she squeezed in that sixth one um which is of course you know understanding what you are willing to compromise on so as much as there are certain certificates of compliance that are going to be ticked over just be clear about what you're actually willing to maybe fix if you find that it's something faulty so it's not something that you're going to say you'll decrease the value uh, of the purchase price by x amount because you have to deal with it so if you understand those things then it should essentially make your home buying journey a bit better and that's it for today's evening of the private property podcast i hope you found this very insightful continue sending your questions and comments below and we'll be more than happy to not just answer them but also deal with them in the subsequent episodes i've been your host zamantunga kumalo hoping you stay home and you're staying safe as we brave the lockdown South Africa that we're all in. Until tomorrow evening, good night.